There are watches and there are watch makers. Watches don't just appear. There are people in workshops who are designing, making, decorating, finishing, assembling. There are complete careers based around the watch industry. I'll do this as long as I possibly can because I love what I do. Is there people that do some things better than me? Certainly. Is there some things that I might do better than others? That's possible, but I don't put titles on myself. I just enjoy being called a watchmaker. I consider myself a master watchmaker. We are producing something that's obsolete, which is a craft, an art form. That's what I really enjoy about watchmaking. My name is Roland Murphy. I am a watchmaker. I'm the founder of RGM Watch Company here in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and uh, we build watches. So on the underside, he's doing something called perlage or purling. It's the small circle decorations that overlap each other, and it's a traditional finish you would see uh, in high-grade watchmaking. There's a lot of decoration on high-grade traditional watches that's only seen by the watchmaker. Some of the decoration is seen on top, but a lot of the decoration is actually hidden. And it's only seen when the watchmaker is either assembling the watch or servicing the watch later. In the world that we live in, it's kind of unheard of to decorate an area that's not seen. But a lot of things made a hundred years ago or more, you know, there's a lot of pride taken in making and manufacturing and doing something even if it wasn't known or seen by the average person. And I think that's what really makes something even that much more special, is that you know that that, that care and that thought went into manufacturing, finishing, decorating, styling, um, even if not every aspect of it is seen. You know, I used to be the young guy in the business. Now I'm, you know, the older guy in the business. The business has changed a lot. But when watchmaking ceased here in 1969, nobody was doing anything in series. So when we came out with the 801 in 2007, and then we followed with our Turbion and our Caliber 20, these were the first watches made in series in the U.S., where basically 90% of the components made here in Pennsylvania. So really that kind of brought some watchmaking back here, fine pieces that are basically more uh, hand-built. You know, we were the first ones to, to start doing that again. There's others trying to do that. I'm Cameron Weiss, and I am the founder and master watchmaker at Weiss Watch Company. I am 37 years old. I'm definitely one of the younger watchmakers around. Most of my watchmaking peers are in their 50s, 60s, I even have some watchmaking friends in Switzerland who are in their late 70s. That's pretty typical in Switzerland, but here in the US, we don't have as much of that knowledge transfer from the older generation to the younger generation. Got my bar of metal over here. So in watchmaking, we are almost always starting with some sort of bar of metal. This particular machine, we put in round bars and we use it for making watch cases and we can machine a watch case off the front of that bar. It's kind of like making a sculpture where you start with more material and then we actually remove what we don't want, leaving behind only what we do want, which is our watch case. This right here is the very end of that three foot bar sticking out of a collet and we can machine the watch case off the front of that bar and a three foot bar We'll do over a hundred watch cases. Visually, much nicer. Yeah, I like it. I mean, an RGM watch, if you know what you're looking at or holding, the cases are always solid materials. The watch is always mechanical. Not always, but often there's an engine turn or a guilloche hand cut dial. You know, of course our name's on the dial too, so that, that's, a, that's an easy giveaway, but it's the quality, the classic styling. We don't go with like trends. Our watches, whether it was made 20 years ago, 30 years ago, today is still gonna be something that you could wear today, tomorrow, 20 years from now. At least as long as I'm alive, that's how it's gonna be. I'm focusing on the finishing the decoration, so on a simple watch case, making sure that there are different types of finishing present to almost make it like 
elevating the most basic wristwatch to something that has been made with a lot of care, a lot of skill and craft, focusing on the fact that this watch was made to tell time, but it was made to be beautiful and to last a long time as well. The movement is the mechanism that's running the watch. Let's say you had a car, it would kind of be like the motor. That is the mechanical, in a mechanical watch, or in a quartz watch, it's still a movement. We only make mechanical watches, so the movement is that mechanism that's wound in one way or the other, either manually or automatically, that's actually running the watch and running the hands and displaying the time. Everything else is kind of what goes around it. Dial, hands, case, strap, bracelet. That movement has to be very precisely made, so it's one of the most complex parts of a watch to make. And I say it's a part, but it is actually going to be at least a hundred pieces that go into a movement. Okay, so Alan's working on a caliber 20. It's one of our in-house movements. Uh, the seconds are displayed on a disc. So it's one of our higher end pieces. Manufacturing a movement is very difficult. Even if somebody hands you the design, it's like a mountain, it's climbing a mountain. And being able to do that successfully and repeat doing it is one of the more difficult things to do. It wasn't until 2007 that we delivered our first watch with an in-house movement that we did here at RGM. In Switzerland, the big companies, they say there's what I call industrialized movements. It costs millions of dollars for them to do that, but then they have machines and equipment that can make these parts over and over again, and the watch goes together every time everything lines up. It's a very different process of what we do, but we're not making uh, volume. In a year's time, we're making less than a hundred of our own in-house movements. With watch movements, we are producing something that's obsolete. We are taking from historical examples and then adding our own aesthetics, maybe some little updates, right? But it's rare for a, a watchmaker these days to be inventing something completely new. For our Caliber 1003, I actually took a Swiss movement that has been around for a very long time and redesigned it by first reverse engineering it completely and then modifying those designs. Yes, I designed elements of it, but there's always a lot of knowledge and history from other watchmakers that did all the heavy lifting of coming up with the escapement design, the ratios between gears. All of that has kind of been discovered as what is actually the most efficient and what is the best. This is one of our small uh, CNC milling machines. Uh, CNC stands for Computer Numeric Control. So this is part of the, let's say, newer technology that we use in making watch parts. Basically, we'll design the parts in the uh, software we have upstairs, be programmed into the CAM software, and then the CAM software is what controls these milling machines. And then from there, there's a series of decorations by hand, and then we can move on to the next step of, uh, of using this, com this component. So these are CNC machines, and CNC stands for Computer Numerical Control. We can actually control these machines with a series of codes. We had a battery fault, so we lost the home positions on this machine which means it'll take about a day of rehoming in order for this machine to actually know where all of its moving parts are located. Because it's a robot, basically it needs to know its body. So what we have here, we have a, a simulation, as you can see, it's simulating the milling of the uh, engraved area of the RGM logo. And it will, the machines will follow this exact path. Do you design which way the machine's going to move around it, or does it figure that out itself? No, it's a robot. It does what I ask it to. So you're literally drawing out... Where it starts and all of that. Yeah. yeah. The CAM software has to tell the machine where does it start, what tool does it pick up, what is the speed that it's spinning. And there's a lot of information that has to be programmed into the CAM software to actually have it you know, make a part. What's the typical runtime to run one side two uh, barrel bridges, Tony? Two hours. About two hours? Two hour each. Well, th this is the finished part, basically. But they start as a, as a, as a, as a blank. You're gonna start with something like that. 
you know, you're going to start with nothing. You can see some of the progression from a raw plate to a finished, as far as the machining goes, barrel bridges. Other parts we make from bar are these little blanks. So this is just a piece of brass that has been cut off of a longer bar. We slice it like you would slice butter. And then we can place it into this pallet here that holds a bunch of those pieces of brass. And we can cut parts like a main plate out of that brass. It's being held by a couple of tabs, which we can then pop it out. Kind of like those model kits we played with as kids. And then there's a little piece right there that we'll hand file. That's where it was being held in here. Did you design that piece? Yes, from an existing uh, watch design. Everything that's in a typical main plate will be in every single main plate ever made. That's why we simply just call it a main plate. In the building here, we're making bridges, main plates, setting parts, regulation parts, winding wheels. There's a number of parts. I'm sure I'm missing a number of them there. Parts that we have made locally in Pennsylvania here, some case parts. We give them a drawing, they just make a part. That raw part comes here. Some parts that we get out of Switzerland would be the balance, the escapement, mainspring, jewels. For us, it would never make sense for us to manufacture jewels. You know, somebody asked me that one time. I said, well, if I wanted to go out of the business, that might be the quickest way I'd do it, whether you try to set up and make all of our own jewels. So you have to make um, decisions that make sense, like a mainspring. That's another thing. We're never going to make mainsprings. Yeah, so sapphire components and some of our mainsprings come from Switzerland. Springs require very special forming equipment in order to form the spring into the profile shape that it is. All those springs have different shapes. One is a rectangular cross section and it's extraordinarily thin like a human hair. And they all have different tempers, meaning they've been heat treated to perform different tasks and their springiness is altered. I don't do any of that work here. We actually make the cases here. We make the main plates here, the bridges, buckles for the straps. We make wheels, screws. On this machine here, we are also cutting bars of metal. But these bars of metal are very small. This bar is used for making movement screws, pinions, winding stems, anything under four millimeters. As an example, I have some screws that I am machining on this right now. Why not just buy screws from somebody else? I get that question a lot. I'm a watchmaker, and so I actually want to make the parts. Even if it's not the best financial decision, because all these machines are very expensive, this machine is around $300,000, and operating them is very time consuming. For me, this is the part of watchmaking that I love. I love to take the raw metal and turn it into parts that then can be turned into watches. So it's kind of a selfish pursuit. We're doing the damaskining, or in French, the Côte de Genève uh, circular decoration on top of a barrel bridge. And this puts a beautiful decoration that when you move your watch, you'll see the light playing differently on each line. Well, this is a traditional technique. The trick was getting a machine to do it. This is an American-made machine that we've adapted. We bought a dedicated machine in Switzerland at the time, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. It was around $20,000. Um, this is a servo drill press that is on a milling base, which they made um, a few of like this, and this could be easily converted to do this type of work for us. So, um, so we have a nice heavy duty setup, um, but at a fraction of the price. I really love the standard issue field watch case design. When you start to look at the design and see the different polishing finishes and how everything lines up, you realize that there's been a lot of time spent could be many hours on just making sure that all of the design elements are executed perfectly on even a simple watch to make sure that the craft of watchmaking is really coming through 
in a simple design. I really like simplicity, but with that simplicity, I want to try and add to it. So elevating even the most simple design with finishing techniques that can elevate a simple piece of stainless steel to something that is beautiful. That's what I really enjoy looking at in the end. This is a rose engine or an engine turning machine. This is a round machine. It's really a form of a lathe, it does geometric engraving. So this type of machine is used for decoration. Each line is cut and the machine is adjusted uh, by hand. So we can create all sorts of patterns depending on how we change the spacing, offsetting of the work. Now what we're gonna do is I'm gonna pull the cutter away from the work and we're going to make our next adjustment. So we're gonna move the slide over with this ratchet. And then in the back here, we're going to offset the rosette from the work. And now it's ready to cut another line. It's very quiet. There's no motors, no engines, just a hand cranked machine. You wanna keep an even pressure with your hands on the cutter. As you're moving the work, the cutter is stationary. The actual uh, engine turning guilloche part uh, depends on uh, the complexity of the pattern. So it could be anywhere from maybe something that would take a few hours to something that could take a half a day. Uh, of course, if you lose concentration, make a mistake, um, you can ruin it even after you may have all kinds of time invested in it and you start over. So there's the, there's the low part that can be uh, an unpleasant feeling Then you just throw it away, it's scrap and you start over. So, um, so you, you want to try to keep your concentration, you know. One of the first things I realized um, when visiting Swiss watchmakers was how much technology had been adopted into the watchmaking industry. And a little higher tech over here would be laser marking. So on here, we can fix your parts on this table and there's a laser up here. When the laser beams come in and focus, that focal plane is where we can actually remove metal. So we can do a deep laser engraving or laser cutting. So this is perfect for marking buckles and crowns, different parts of the watch that we want to put markings on. So we would make the part and then we put the part in here and it would be in there for about 45 minutes and we had a tray of parts. So this fixture holds the oscillating weights in position while we cut the logo out. And the reason to use a laser as opposed to a milling machine, the laser has no dimension. It will focus at one point and we can have sharp corners inside on those cuts. We make about 800 watches a year. This year, I was able to hire two additional staff members here, one watchmaker and one design engineer. And with that, I hope that we'll be able to start a little more growth and train more watchmakers. I think with the handful of American watchmakers we have now, all kind of doing their own thing, the future for American watchmaking is quite bright. We also have Roland Murphy of RGM Watch Company, and he is one of the original American watchmakers who set out on his own to actually make watch movements and, and watch parts in the US. So my goal really is to build something in such a way that it can live beyond me. And I think if it even lived one generation further than me, I would be extraordinarily proud. Everybody today didn't have the start I had. It's a different world, it's a different industry. Uh, everything is closer together than it used to be. And I really don't spend as much time as you might think trying to see what everybody else is doing because we don't design watches based on like, you know, what does the market want now? We've never done that. We, we've always stayed in the classic realm. We make things that, that I like and want to make. And I hope there's enough people 
um, that can appreciate that and would also want them. Certainly there are guys out there doing some things and that's good. You know, I was that guy uh, at one time, so I can appreciate the uh, climb. You know, some will make it, some won't. In watchmaking, uh, I just want people to think, you know, that he made really nice watches. He, he stuck to his uh, core quality uh, beliefs in watchmaking and, and really made things that, that last and that people would still want.